Welcome to Saint Andrew Presbyterian Church of Tulsa, Oklahoma. We are so glad that you have chosen and joined with us this morning and worship our Almighty God together. We continue to encourage you to pray for the uh, country of Myanmar and pray for the, the COVID-19 and pray for the whole family together. So may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, all in the United States and the world. Now let us prepare our hearts and minds to worship our Almighty God as we receive this morning's prelude. Please join with me call to worship this morning. The days ahead seem dark and full body. It may seem like there is no way through the darkness. Let us bear witness to God's new life moving within and among us. God is doing a new thing. Let us rejoice and give thanks.
Please join with me the call to confession and silent prayer today. Let us come to God in prayer. O source of new life, you promise to set us free from faith or fear, doubt, and denial. Yet we resist your invitation, seeing only what we must give up if we are to follow Jesus. You call us to have faith in your sustaining presence, but your call takes us beyond anything we can see or touch. Forgive us when we turn away from your promise of new life. Heal us and lead us home in Jesus' name. Assurance of God this morning. When we seek to live behind our old ways, God gives us strength. In, In the name of Christ, we, we are healed of our sins, sins, forgiven and restored. Thanks be to God. I don't really have any early memories of Lent. Uh, I grew up in a Baptist church until I was in um, eighth grade. And uh, we were in a very Protestant part of, um, of the country. Uh, so not only was it Baptist, but Methodist and Presbyterians uh, were all very similar. So none of us did anything about Lent uh, or Ash Wednesday. And uh, so I, the, the only thing I knew about Lent was that Catholics in South Louisiana, uh, they, they actually didn't really do Lent because uh, they were much more into having fun prior to Lent before uh, the beginning of Ash Wednesday. So my, my thought about Lent was, it was just an excuse for partying. And so I never had a whole lot of positive thoughts about Lent. I know Sandra, you grew up a Baptist too. So yes. did you have any experience with Lent? My 
experiences with Lynn are a little different. I did grow up in a Baptist church also. Lynn and I were both baptized in Baptist churches. I grew up in a large Baptist church, First Baptist Church in downtown Tulsa. Many of the hymns that are sung during Lent, we sang, but we didn't recognize it or call it Lent. We didn't um, celebrate Ash Wednesday or Monday Thursday or Good Friday. We did celebrate Palm Sunday mm. and Easter. But I lived across the street from a Catholic family, and they certainly did celebrate Lent. And, fa and they, they, those were in the days when they didn't, Catholics did not eat um, meat on Friday. And I remember my friends eating fish usually on Friday, or they would eat macaroni and cheese. And, you know, wouldn't you know, of course, being Catholic, they, they felt like they had to eat fish, so they didn't like fish. Now, I thought their fish was wonderful. So a lot of times they would always invite me to have Friday dinner with them because the more fish that was eaten, <laughs> they didn't have to save it and eat it again. <laughs> so they, they weren't crazy about fish. So my little friends and I, they were twin girls. It was a family of six. And they were, oh, a year older than I was. They went to the Catholic Church, uh, not only the Catholic Church, but it was also a Catholic school in our neighborhood. They went to Madeline, which is also, a, it's not a school anymore, I don't believe, but the church is still vital. And so we would make our mud pies, and we talked religion. And the differences in what our churches did, a Baptist church, and what we believed, and what Catholic churches believed. Well, this kind of got me in trouble, because when I went to church on Sunday, in Sunday school, um, I had a Sunday school teacher, bless her heart, I was really a challenge for her, because she would start to tell what Catholics believed, and I would say, no, that's not what they believe. And I knew firsthand that that wasn't true, what they didn't believe. <laughs> and so <laughs> she even talked to the pastor about it, and he talked with me, and he talked with my parents about it, and said, you know, just don't, he said to the Sunday school teacher, let's not talk about Catholicism in Sunday school because she's right. She does know. And what she is saying is true <laughs> because he knew about Catholicism, being a pastor and knowing, uh, having studied religion and going, you know, to a seminary. So um, he said, what she's saying is true. So let's not cross that bridge. But so the things that I remember that my Catholic friends did about Lent, they always gave up something. And I remember my friends always complaining as little girls, we have to do this. We have to eat fish on Friday. Oh, here comes Friday. We've got to eat fish. Why don't you come over to dinner? Because you like fish and we don't like it. And if we don't, if we have any left over, we've got to eat it again. And their parents didn't like fish either. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, a, it was a drudgery for them. But what I remember about them and Lent is that they gave up things, you know, for those 40 days. And it had to be something that they really loved. And I thought at the time, as a little girl growing up, why, if, if you were doing this for Jesus, if you were doing this for Christ, why did you complain about it. In fact, I asked them, why are you complaining about this? Well, because we have to do it. I said, but why are you doing it? And they explained that the way the nuns had told them that, um, and the priest, that you did this because Christ suffered for you, so you need to experience suffering yourself. As an adult, when I, um, was no longer a member of the Baptist Church, and I had sung for many, as a musician, sung for many, many churches uh, outside of every denomination, um, Presbyterian, Methodist, Episcopalian, I'd sung for Christian scientists, um, just about every church there is an imaginable, even the Church of Christ scientists that you hear so about, much about in California. I got a different perspective completely I grew up then thinking, after I, all of those many years, that Lent really is a good thing. 
And I really f- started feeling that more when I was t- attending the Methodist Church, and even more so in the Presbyterian Church. And my thoughts and beliefs about Lent and what I do for Lent is, I guess, a little different from someone else's perspective. I'm th- I think of what Christ did for us, what he gave us. I think about giving us eternal life. And so for Lent, what I have made a habit of doing, and I haven't shared this with anyone before, but what I make a habit of doing is doing something good for someone or someone's every day of Lent. Mm. So instead of giving up, I give to. Mm. Mm. That's my idea of Lent, not giving up, not sacrificing, but sacrificing yourself by giving and doing something for someone as Christ did something for us. Now, the gifts I can give have no comparison with the gift that Christ gave us. But that is my way of celebrating Lent, is giving, giving of myself as Christ gave of himself for us. Mm. So I don't think of Lent as giving up. I think of it as giving forth. As I became a Presbyterian uh, when I was in the ninth grade, uh, that uh, church and that whole area did not do anything with Lent. And as I became a pastor, my first pastorate also did not uh, observe Lent. And my second pastorate was in South Louisiana where there were uh, many, many Catholics who observed Lent. I, I kidded our members that they didn't believe in Lent, but they certainly believed in Mardi Gras, you know. And uh, so uh, I did not uh, pastor a church that, that uh, observed Lent at all until I moved to Tulsa. And uh, we have had in various churches, including here, um, Ash Wednesday and um, other activities, Um, But I think one of the best ways that I have heard to think about Lent, uh, after the Roman Catholic Vatican Council in uh, the mid-60s, they dropped a lot of these requirements that uh, Catholics not eat meat on Friday, for example. And, uh, you know, nobody likes change. I, I felt it very amusing that Catholic friends would complain that they were not required to give something up when they complained when they had to give it up. But a very devout Catholic friend uh, in South Louisiana said, uh, you know, I didn't give up meat because the church told me I had to. I gave up meat as a sign of my uh, love for Christ. And I can still give up meat, whether the church requires it or not. And and I thought that was a very helpful attitude to say, this is something I do out of my devotion as as what I want to do. Something like what you've said about giving as opposed to giving up. And uh, I, I think that has a lot of merit. I do think Ash Wednesday has merit in that it focuses our attention on our sinfulness and our mortality and and uh, helps keep our life in perspective. Uh, but that's very different from just doing something because of a rule or some external organization telling you have to do that. So... So I've never been much for, for Lent. <laughs> and in fact, I'm not a very disciplined person at all. Uh, a, a while back, my doctor told me that uh, I, was, I was doing well, but he said, you could get more exercise and lose some weight. And I said, but doctor, I have never been on a diet in my entire life 
and I'm not going to start now, and I'm not much for exercise. I would get a lot of exercise uh, naturally, and I think this is this is an important lesson for all of us. I think whether we observe Lent or not, whether we are disciplined or not, we need the habits of the Christian faith, uh, including prayer and scripture reading. Some people just do that naturally. They pray during the day, they read the scriptures. Some people need a, a discipline of doing it exactly at six o'clock every morning or 11 o'clock every night. Uh, I don't think that matters, but uh, if we don't exercise you know, intentionally, we need to be sure we get enough exercise. And I used to do that. I used to take the stairs at the hospital instead of the elevator, for example. So we need, we need to be disciplined, even if it's in an undisciplined way. Uh, we need to be open to, to the Spirit working with us. So... And now we're reading from the Old Testament, Numbers, chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. From Mount Hor, Moses and the Israelites set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord set poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. New Testament scripture reading today is from the Gospel according to John, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. This is the second part of the story of Nicodemus coming to Jesus by night. We pick the story up in verse 14. As Jesus is talking to Nicodemus and really to all Christians. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned. Those who do not believe are condemned already, because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. 
Here ends our reading from John chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In just a few months, Tulsa will be observing the 100th anniversary of the Tulsa Race Massacre, or what used to be called the Race Riot. And I was thinking about that uh, some 25 years ago, my wife served on a planning committee as the city observed the 75th anniversary. Uh, and there were plans for all kinds of activities, for youth, for older people, and, and a religious service uh, to be held in the Maxwell Convention Center, uh, which was, uh, is now called the Cox Business Center. Uh, it, it had all kinds of activities. It, it had a bell choir, it had choirs, uh, it had uh, Indian, that is from India, uh, dancers, uh, preachers, uh, all kinds of activities symbolizing our remembrance of the 75th anniversary of the riot. Uh, one of my favorites that I, I didn't go back and check this out, but I remember an older group of men who were, were singers and they, they sat in rockers and, and sang gospel songs, and they called themselves, I think, the church rockers or the holy rollers or something like that. Uh, and, and so it was, a, it was an occasion of, of celebration and of memory. But you know what really I remember about that? How many people came up to my wife or to me and said, you know, I grew up in Tulsa and I never heard about the race riot. Nobody ever said anything about that. Well, on the one hand, I, I certainly understood. If, if you think about it, how much do, does any of us remember from our schooling growing up? But beyond that, there has been <clears throat> a, a tendency to only talk about positive things, to, to not uh, want to emphasize bad situations, bad problems. We want to kind of push them aside and ignore them and, and, and pretend they didn't ever exist. And, and recently that concern has bubbled back up to the surface. There are uh, educators, parents, people that are concerned that in, in our education we are not emphasizing enough of history, of civics, uh, of how to govern and how to lead, how to get along with one another. Uh, so there are various projects that, that would lift up our history and our form of government. When uh, we have taught citizenship classes to new people in this country, uh, we emphasize civics and history and, and how does our government work? What are the principles upon which we uh, build up our government? But, but you know, like most everything else in our society within the last few years, this even has become politicalized. Uh, some people feel like we ought to teach this way, and some people think we ought to teach this way. Even with the Tulsa race riot, there, there are some that say we should emphasize the, the, the atrocity and how awful it was and, and how people were victimized, and others will say, well, that's true, but, but we really should emphasize how people rebuilt Greenwood after the riot and, and how people lifted themselves up. So we can't even seem to agree on what and how we teach history. 
I come down on one side of that argument because as Christians, we believe in recognizing and confessing our sin, not hiding it away somewhere. And, and the New Testament is very clear about that. Uh, the writers inspired by the Holy Spirit were very blunt about the shortcomings of Jesus' disciples. Peter was called Satan by Jesus. James and John fought over who would be the greatest. Shortcomings were acknowledged and confessed. And, and the Israelites before then had that same realistic approach to life. Remember Abraham lied about his wife Sarah to save his own life. Isaac did the same thing and Jacob was a, a scoundrel. And then of course we know of King David who was a man after God's own heart and yet and yet he committed adultery and conspiracy to murder. The scriptures are very honest about our shortcomings and failures because to God belongs the glory. And in our Old Testament scripture today, we have yet another example of the, the, the failures of God's people acknowledged, recognized, and confessed. The people of Israel have left Egypt. They are traveling through the wilderness. They have come to Canaan. And, and it says that one of the kings of Canaan captured some of the Israelites. And then they went to war and the Israelites overcame this king. They were victorious. God was victorious for them. They should have been happy. They should have been grateful. They should have thanked God, right? Well, no. They complained. They went to Moses and it says, and God, and complained they had no water and no food. And besides, we don't like this food. Wait a minute. If they had no food and no water, how could they say they didn't like it? You know, there are some textual scholars that will say, you know, these, these uh, scriptures were written down by scribes by hand, and, and probably they just stuck in an extra word. Probably originally it said they didn't have any water and they detested the food. I don't think that. Anybody that has raised kids knows that statement could be entirely true. Ma, there's nothing to eat. Well, make yourself a peanut butter sandwich. Ma, there's nothing to eat. I hate peanut butter. Ma, can't you imagine people saying, we don't have anything to eat, we don't have anything to drink, and we don't like what we have? <laughs> now, I, I've got to admit, I have a little trouble with what comes next because it says, it says that God heard their complaining and he sent poisonous snakes to them. You can almost imagine God being a father coming home from a long day at work and he's tired and the kids are complaining and whining and fighting and, and him saying to them, well, you think this is bad. You just wait till tomorrow when I send snakes after you. Now, I don't think it happened that way. I think they complained and then they ran into some territory with some snakes and, and the light bulb went on and they, they began thinking about it. We should not have complained to God about the water and the food. 
And so they attributed this as a, a, as a judgment. Now, God does judge us, but I don't know. I, I think maybe they are putting this off on God. But in any case, in any case, they made the connection. And so they came to Moses and said, we have sinned. We have done wrong. We should not have complained about the water and the food. <clears throat> and now we're dying from snake bites. Do something. Ask God to forgive us and, and heal us. And so Moses talked to the Lord and the Lord said, well, Moses, I want you to make a bronze serpent and put it up on a pole. So when people get bit by a snake, they can come and they can look at the serpent on the pole and be healed. Now, we don't have any photographs of that, of course, but I kind of envision that serpent as being a long straight bar mounted on a pole, making a T or a cross. How are we to interpret that? Is it magic, superstition? I think what happened as the people looked up at the serpent, they were made yet again aware of their sin and shortcomings and confessed their sin to God and pleaded for forgiveness. And God forgave them and renewed them and kept them going toward the promised land. In the New Testament reading that typically focuses on Nicodemus or on John 3, 16, that very famous passage, it begins with this. Jesus says to Nicodemus and to everyone through the scriptures, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so the Son of Man, so I must be lifted up. Isn't that a, a strange comparison that Jesus went all the way back to Moses and, and a serpent in the wilderness? What, what is he talking about? Well, you know, in the Gospel of John, there are repeated examples of misunderstandings of words, words with double meanings. Last week we saw that Jesus referred to the temple, the building, but also the temple of his body. In the story of Nicodemus, we hear of being born again or being born from above, being born spiritually, being born physically. In the story of the woman at the well, there is a discussion of living water. She means flowing water, fresh water. Jesus meant spiritual water, water that, that quenches our spiritual thirst and gives us life. So here, there is also a, a double meaning. To be lifted up is the same as being exalted. So, even today among some Christians, they will pray to the Lord with their hands up, praising God, thanking God, exalting God, lifting up God. So Jesus is saying that we will see him lifted up on the cross and exalted on the cross. The cross is not simply an, an awful, horrible death, which it is. It is the beginning of the Son of Man, of Jesus ascending to the Father. So in John, the cross and the resurrection and the ascension are all part of one kind of action. Uh, you, you can't quite think this way, but, but in, in spatial terms, it is as if the Son of Man, the Word, came down and dwelt among us, and then in the cross and in the resurrection, 
and in the ascension was lifted back up to the Father. So Jesus is looking forward, looking ahead to his death on the cross at which time he is lifted up, but he is also exalted. So you and I, just as the Israelites in the wilderness, look up, look up to the cross, look up to a sign of God's love, look up to salvation in Christ, look up look up. But you know, there's another place where this bronze serpent is mentioned. In the stories of the kings of Israel, there's a mention of Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a good king. He, he drove out the Baals. He cut down the, the sacred poles that people worshiped. He, he centered worship in the temple in Jerusalem. And the story says that he did one other thing. He broke up Moses' bronze serpent. Apparently, all this time, from Moses to Hezekiah, people were worshiping this bronze serpent. He broke it up, destroyed it, because that serpent had become an idol. People were looking up to it as if it were God rather than trusting in the Lord God. And, and that should remind us that we too worship Father, Son, and Spirit. We too know we have life in Christ because of his death and resurrection but we do not worship the cross. And, and in fact, sometimes we turn the cross into an idol itself. People who are not Christian wear crosses. People put crosses on buildings when, when they have long since to be Christian. The bronze serpent in the temple had become an idol that people worshiped. Hezekiah broke it up. You and I need to lift up Jesus on the cross, exalt Jesus on the cross, knowing that the resurrection is coming. Christians through the centuries have, have recognized this reality. Isaac Watts, one of the, the most famous hymn writers of uh, the church, the century before the American Revolution, 1700s, uh, wrote many, many hymns, including When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, and he also wrote Alas, and Did My Savior Bleed. And Did My Sovereign Die? Would he devote that sacred head for sinners such as I? Drops of grief can ne'er repay the debt of love I owe. Here, Lord, I give myself away. Tis all that I can do. And then a more recent hymn, Lift High the Cross, the love of Christ proclaim till all the world adore his sacred name. Come Christians follow where our Savior trod, the Lamb victorious, Christ the Son of God. So shall our song of triumph ever be, praise to the crucified for victory. The Son of Man came to give his life for us, lifting up on the cross, exalted that we can know life in him. Let us pray. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, 
we join with Christians through the centuries, lifting Christ up, glorifying Christ, praising Christ for his self-giving, for the love that we have come to know as we journey to Lent, to the cross, and to the resurrection. We pray, O oh Lord, that the Holy Spirit will move us into deeper service and commitment, glorifying you in all that we do. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
Once again, we are so glad that you have joined us today in worship as we are all part of God's church, as we look to the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us in glorifying and serving Him. And as we conclude this service, we pray that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, communion, fellowship, the Holy Spirit, will be with all of us today and forever. Amen. <laughs>